Hitler! Ah, shit. That's not how to introduce a podcast. Oh, boy. That went bad. Uh, Off to a not a great start. Uh, I just said Hitler. That was just, that's the worst introduction yet. Maybe earlier you were talking about Gary Hitler. Like, Who's that? Todd Hitler. I don't know. There's got to be you t- someone. Is Jerry Hitler like the 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 clone of Gerald Ford and Adolf Hitler? I think that he's just an briefly ran guy the country with an oh. unfortunate name. <laughs> well, Probably now I've made up. It. I've invented a whole canon for the Gerald Ford Hitler hybrid in my head. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's mm-hmm. the uh, that's what the the cutscenes from um yeah. the new Star Wars film. Yeah, it, it, Adolf Hitler brought us World War II, Gerald Ford brought us the pardon of Richard Nixon, and Jerry Hitler brought us the Dodge Dart. So who's the real monster? <laughs> the real monster? <laughs> so I know I'm going to go li- with Hitler. Listeners, we're not even the first talking one, the, not about Hitler, Jerry. guys. Pardon? What? Not, this episode's not about Hitler. You just got people so upset. I know, I know, I know. This is about Hitler, guys. Okay. This is the worst introduction yet. Uh, I'm Robert Evans. This is behind the bastards, the podcast where we talk about terrible people. My ghost today is Cody Johnston. Cody, how are you doing? Ghost today? You called him your ghost? It's a spooky episode. The ghost in the room is Katie Stoll, who is is not completing our triumvirate as per usual. Yeah, it's um, weird. I feel really that unbalanced. Is weird. It is very weird. It is odd. You it's know, uncomfortable. Just like, it's really, it's I keep like looking. Here, like... I keep looking there for Katie, and she's not. I love you, Katie. Mm-hmm. She's I taking can't. a well-deserved day off while Cody and I slog through this story, which has nothing to do with Hitler. Nothing to do with Hitler. Not even a little bit. A little bit. Oh God! <laughs> All right, <laughs> Cody. Hi. What do you know about Hobby Lobby? They did ISIS. <laughs> yes, right? this is the story about how Hobby Lobby literally invented ISIS. Yes, yes. I knew it. No, no. I mean, no? kind of. No? All right. A little bit, but not that much. Okay, well. Yeah. I mean, you've got a lot of work to do, because I've been yeah. convinced over the years that they did ISIS. So. That Hobby Lobby did an ISIS? Yeah, you got to deprogram me from <laughs> my way of thinking now. Yeah, but look at these cute glasses you. Anderson wore from Hobby Lobby for her RBG costume yeah, so on you, Halloween. Yeah, she helped ISIS. Anderson helped yeah, we ISIS. All, yeah. we all, we've all but look. found ourselves needing a Hobby Lobby at one point or another. Maybe you needed some decorative glass jars or yarn and a felt needle at 7.30 at night, oh and if you God. need those things the only place to go is a hobby lobby uh that was gonna be they, my what, example too yeah <laughs> yeah it's, it's just like the store you go for weird little crafty things that no one else is going to carry and the kind of knickknacks that you put in your home when you don't really know what else to put there like eyeglasses uh, that fit a dog like ISIS like eyeglasses that fit the dog for an rbg costume yes. for a dog mm-hmm. It's ironic that you keep bringing up Ruth Bader Ginsburg because this is the story about a group of people who want to make it impossible <laughs> for people like her to sit on the Supreme Court. Oh, uh, that's the tale of Hobby Lobby. So uh, I thought you were talking about ISIS. <laughs> a little bit. Okay. I mean, you know, you, right. you have probably heard as Cody has been constantly referring I, I to. Can't, I like, can't stop thinking about it. Yeah, that Hobby Lobby got in some trouble for maybe funding ISIS. Uh, and yeah, that's not technically true um hobby lobby did not exactly fund like the islamic state uh itself mm. um but Losers. they did <laughs> they did help to fund some other islamic extremist organizations that were precursors to isis mm. and more to the point you can make a strong case that they're working to set up a christian equivalent to isis right here in the u.s of a oh and that's the story we're going to talk about god god Damn yeah, it, Robert. Yeah, you wish they were just funding ISIS. I, I do now. <laughs> Good old wholesome ISIS. <laughs> uh, starting near rock bottom, but don't worry, yeah. it gets a little lower. It'll keep getting lower. Okay. But before we talk about how everything that I just talked about winds up happening, we have to go back in time a little bit to talk about the beginning of Hobby Lobby. Cody, mm. could you give me some mood setting time machine noises? No. <laughs> perfect perfect a- Anderson really did not like that I'm just gonna put it out there it's a new it's, it's a new model it's a new model all right some some of the scientists listening can graph the differences between your time machine noises when Katie is and is not present mm-hmm. um, that one was much more like a tyrannosaurus or perhaps a, 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 a pterodactyl yeah, pterodactyl. Some yeah. like some like really really old bird. That was yeah. messed up. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
David Green was born on November 13th, 1941 in Emporia, Kansas. His father was a preacher uh, and not a particularly big deal within that world. He wasn't like a, a big time preacher. He moved around from like congregation to congregation in tiny little towns in uh, Kansas uh, and eventually escaping the hellish wastes of Kansas for the hellish wastes of Oklahoma. Yeah. Uh, the family settled in a town called Altus, where David's father preached to a flock of 35 people who were vastly outnumbered by the cows on their farms. So he's got humble beginnings, you could say. Mm hmm. Um, now, David grew up in Altus, which is about five hours away from the tiny town in Oklahoma where I grew up. Uh, it was as close to the middle of nowhere as you can get, and they were very poor. Uh, David would have worn nothing but secondhand clothing and eaten primarily food donated to his family by the congregation. Uh, the Green family could go weeks at a time without eating meat. So they are the kind of poor where, like, you just don't even, money's not even a factor in your life. Right. Um, but still, his mom found ways to give what little they had to other families in Altus. In interviews today, David remembers his mother and father sacrificing their tiny comforts and even their necessities for the good of the community. Religion was the very air he breathed as a child, and all five of David's brothers and sisters grew up to be either pastors or pastors' wives. But a life of preaching and poverty was not for David. He struggled at school and had to repeat the seventh grade, but he had no desire to focus on the Bible for a living. Instead, he started working in the business world as soon as he could. During his junior year of high school, David got involved in a work-study program and landed a gig as a stock boy in the town general store. He only made 60 cents an hour, but he became aware of the basics of how capitalism works, watching his boss buy products for 10 cents and sell them for 20. So that's like his, uh, yeah. His, his, yeah, he, he falls in love with, yeah. with this idea. Planting the it's like seed. Mm -hmm. It's like transubstantiation, but with pennies. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm, I, I look forward to finding out what he does with this information. Yeah. Now, this world, well, new worldview. <laughs> yeah. um, and so while David's mom gave until it hurt and while his siblings committed themselves to serving their communities, David found himself more enthralled with the idea of profiting from his fellow man. And over the course of his early and mid-twenties, David served in the Air Force Reserve and married a woman named Barbara, who he'd met while working at the general store. He turned his work experience into a job as a manager at TG&Y, a five-and-dime shop that sold odds and ends. By the time he was 29, he decided he'd learned enough to, working at these businesses to do a better job starting his own. So he borrowed $600 to buy up equipment and inventory and teamed up with another manager from his store to create his first business, selling miniature picture frames to stores like TG&Y, where he'd worked so like too small to really like put pictures in just like right. the kind of knickknacks you stick up around the house for no reason yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> like a slightly slightly bigger than wallet size yeah like, all right okay okay yeah tiny little picture frames that are basically just knickknacks for like old women to turn into craft projects yeah. like that's the business he decides to go into it's for really, some reason really specific very specific oh my God. <laughs> but you know there's a market you got you uh, yeah. you corner that he had a very weird, specific dream, and it turned out to work very work well. really well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so his wife and sons uh, assembled these tiny picture frames on their kitchen table and received seven cents apiece from dad for their labor. Uh, the whole enterprise was profitable for reasons that I cannot understand. And by <laughs> 1972, Green had enough money to open his first actual store, a 300-square-foot Hobby Lobby in Oklahoma City. So, okay. Okay, yeah, there we so go. it was like the inventory. It was it wasn't just picture frames at that point. It was like, all right, it's just like the hobby when he lobby opens that we his know. first Hobby Lobby. Yeah, he he expands beyond shitty picture frames. Yeah, yeah, yeah. To yeah. to shitty other stuff. <laughs> to shitty other stuff. Yeah. yeah, there's a whole wide variety of shitty things for sale. Yeah, do you like Nicks? Do you like Nicks? Yeah. Well, we got them. Yeah, all right, great. We got Nicks. We got Nicks. We have the Nicks. Uh, mm -hmm. which is as useless a sports team as we have, the, a tiny picture frame. You get the knack. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what the knack is. It's an album. Robert just said like a uh, sports diss. Like, nice mm -hmm. job. I liked it. Yes. Yeah. We will not go into any more detail about why the Knicks are terrible. But Terrible. Long time <laughs> listeners will know. Wow. All right. <laughs> Waiting for that episode to drop. It, Oh, it has. <laughs> now, uh, there are different opinions on why Hobby Lobby became a huge success. The CFO, John Cargill, credits David Green's brilliance at merchandising. Uh, he says that Green basically realized that cheap crap like styrofoam roosters and fake books and plastic plants could be produced for pennies overseas and then sold for dollars to American customers. Uh, and there turned out to be an endless appetite among realtors setting up show homes, hotels looking to decorate on the yeah. cheap, and little old ladies with a love of knickknacks. And so David's business exploded from selling cheap, poorly made de 
decorative crap in mass. So that's. I mean, yeah, that's what that's. Yep. There you go. That explains there it all. There you go. That's all. Oh, wow. What a good idea. I, I think at times about like how when the world is like dying and I'm like sitting upon one of the last bits of land that like peaks above the, the, the boiling oceans choking the last remaining life on the surface, how I will explain to children why we let this happen. And I am excited to talk with them about Hobby Lobby. <laughs> That's, yeah. All right, here's the first thing. Well, we the oceans <laughs> had to die because we needed styrofoam roosters to put up in corners of the house that didn't have <laughs> decorations. Yeah. Oh, I'd like to. Uh, I'd like to see that scene gathering around the fire. Mm-hmm. That you actually don't need because, like you said, the boiling oceans. Yeah, the oceans are boiling. Yeah. Covered in soot. Yeah, treating treating wounds, uh, arguing treating over, wounds with styrofoam roosters, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, arguing over who's gonna eat who first, like who's the first to go. Mm-hmm. Oh, it's gonna be good. But then, um, the tale of Hobby Lobby. <laughs> yeah. So one major reason for the success of Hobby Lobby came down to luck and good timing. Right around the time his first store opened, uh, the hippies of the United States became enthralled with beads. The bead buying craze started right at the same time that Green began expanding his business, and it fueled Hobby Lobby's spread to a second 6,000 square foot location. Green was able to quit his job at TG&Y, and he recalls that his wife was not happy with this. She was real comfortable with me working at TG&Y. They were doing $2 billion a year in sales. We did $100,000. Of course, they're gone now, and we're making $3 billion. He's so, not wrong. Yep. He's not wrong. Wait, are yeah, they still so, married? Oh, yeah. yeah okay, so this isn't just like a resentful, like, ah, uh, she said this, but actually we're, it's billions of dollars now. No, no, no. It's more like uh, uh, my, my, my wife... You know, this is why the man mm. has the business sense in the family, because my wife would have had us, yeah, working for a doomed enterprise instead of selling styrofoam roosters to all and sundry. Yeah. Yeah. And now we're doing great because of the good work yep. that we do. Because of the good work that we do. hmm Hobby Lobby today is one of the largest businesses of its kind in the world, operating 520 stores in 32 states. David Green and his family are the sole owners of the business, and over the course of his career, Green's net worth has soared to more than $4.5 billion, and I think it's even more than that now. Uh, Because there are no shareholders or co-owners, David gets to run Hobby Lobby exactly the way he wants. And since he is an evangelical Christian, that's been woven into the character of the business. Sometimes this manifests itself in wacky ways. For example, Example, products in Hobby Lobby do not have barcodes. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. um, there's two explanations for this. Wait, when interviewed, <laughs> yeah, too what? many. There should be yeah. one. The the official explanation from David Green is that computerized point of sale systems make his employees less knowledgeable about their inventory because they rely on a computer to tell them where things go and what things cost. And while it costs more money for the business to have employees like updating prices by hand, it leads to better staff because they know where everything is and what it costs, and they have an understanding that's deeper of the inventory, okay. which is, makes sense. That's, yeah, yeah. It's like that's not an a, an illogical um um theory. Yeah, I'm you ready can, for you to bum me out, but that's actually a good answer. Right. Yeah, that's a very good answer. However, oh, no. <laughs> oh, God. Right. some suggest this hard line against barcodes has more to do with the fact that large chunks of the evangelical Christian population believe that barcodes are the mark of the beast. This rumor is largely perpetuated by folks in blogs, just like barcode conspiracies. And I really have no idea what the truth is. But Hobby Lobby employees regularly talk about the idea that the barcodes, there are no barcodes in the business because it's the mark of the devil. There's a whole like, like there you could find in the era of VHS, like whole VHS tapes explaining how like the barcode is the mark of the beast and like all of the different dashes really stand for 666 and it's the devil's Ooh. way of getting into <laughs> capitalism. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay. So the the conspiracy stuff, like the blogs that are talking mm-hmm. about this aren't people being like making up a wild accusation. It's based off no. of people who have also Huge been numbers saying, of people. Yeah. Who that, believe that barcodes are evil. So it is a belief Yes. And it's just the conspiracy is that that's why they don't do it at Hobby Lobby specifically. But it is. Yeah, exactly. That is is, wild. 
yeah, that belief is a thing that at least a couple of million Americans believe. Oh, that's too many. David said David has a reasonable explanation for why Hobby Lobby doesn't use barcodes, but there's a lot of people that are like, "Come on!" <laughs> oh no! Oh, his first answer was so good. Yeah, it's a really good answer. Yeah, <laughs> like, it's one of those things where it's like, "Oh, that makes complete sense." Yeah, of um, course you would. Yeah, they'd know. Yeah, they'd point over there, like, "Oh yeah, it's this yeah. amount. It used to be this amount." And I, because I did it by hand. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. <laughs> Uh huh. Exactly. Right. Okay. So, um, yeah. Now, David Green's choice to not use barcodes uh, is is fine, regardless of why he does it. You know, he has that right. He's yeah, the sole yeah. proprietor of the what business. You gotta do. What's less fine, in my opinion, are the ways in which he's chosen to spend his fortune. In interviews, David will frequently claim that God is the real manager of his three billion dollar per year empire. He told it's Forbes tight. this. <laughs> If you have anything or I have anything, it's because it's been given to us by our creator. So I've learned to say, look, this is yours, God. It's all yours. I'm going to give it to you. And when he talks about how he uses his wealth in interviews, David tends to say things like this. I want to know that I have affected people for eternity. I believe I am. I believe once someone knows Christ as their personal savior, I've affected eternity. I matter 10 billion years from now. <laughs> yeah, this is. See, we're going in. <laughs> okay, just some, it's little, yeah, it's a little too much. I don't care for that. <laughs> you you don't affect people for eternity by selling them colored mirrors and bookends. Yeah. Um, also, just yeah. like the the phrasing, like affect people. Is yeah, a little, it's like weirdly, unsettling. Yeah, it's unsettling. It's like weirdly clinical and like it doesn't yeah. specify what you mean. It's not. It's not great. It's not great. It's, it's, uh, it's not great. Mm. Billions of years, so, though. That's bill- uh, ten that's, billion years. That is power. That's, power that's right some there. Scientology level yes, it is. delusions, right there. Yeah. So David Green is currently the largest individual donor to evangelical causes in the United States. In 1999, he bought an old VA hospital in Little Rock, Arkansas, and turned it into a church. This proved to be the start of more than $300 million in donations to established churches on 50 different properties. Other Christian leaders have come to see Green as something of a venture capital fund for their religion. He receives proposals on a daily basis for churches and religious schools that need his support. In 2004, he gave a $10 million building to Jerry Falwell's Liberty University. A few years later, he paid off the... (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Man. oh, this is going in so much worse of a direction. Oh. A few years later, he paid off the numerous debts for Oral Roberts University. He has founded numerous Christian foundations uh, through which he has distributed 1.4 billion copies of Christian literature in more than 100 countries. The One Hope Foundation focuses on providing scripture to children aged 4 to 14. The Every Home for Christ Foundation sends missionaries with Bible booklets door to door in the global south. When people suggest that maybe delivering food or medicine might be more <laughs> useful than Bibles in many of these countries, Green has a prepared response. Ooh. It's not like you give them that, but don't give them food. You give both. But, Green insists, if I die without food or without eternal salvation, I want to die without food. <laughs> Can't argue with that. Can't argue with that. If those are the you... two options, <laughs> yeah. if those are the two real options that are, that are, that are definitely on the table, yep, you have the to only choose. Two. The only you two. You have to choose. <clears throat> That's a good point. Good stuff, huh? Ah, oh, I wish I could Good buy Good stuff. I wish I could work at Hobby Lobby now. Oh, you can, Cody. You can. Oh, I shouldn't have said that uh, out loud. I changed my I mind. have good news for all of us. Yeah? Because this podcast is now sponsored and owned entirely by the Hobby Lobby Corporation. Oh, thank goodness. Yeah. And speaking of Hobby Lobby, Cody, have you considered all the different things that Styrofoam Roosters could do to improve your life? Most of them, but probably not all of them. <laughs> I think there are some I probably haven't thought of that I yes. I would buy if I if I were told about them. Yes, with Styrofoam roosters, you don't need, for example, single payer health care. Just jam a rooster in it. Uh-huh. Yes, that's the Hobby Lobby <laughs> message. <laughs> Shove a fake cock in whatever ails you, and <laughs> your problems will be solved. <laughs> Hobby Lobby uh, loves selling fake cocks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On December 28th, 2012, Hobby Lobby made an irrevocable donation of an entire campus in Northfield, Massachusetts to the National Christian Foundation, or NCF. Both Hobby Lobby, the business, and David Green, the billionaire, have made and continue to make numerous donations to the NCF, totaling millions upon millions of dollars. The NCF is, on its face, a nonprofit that supports a variety of Christian causes. But of course, because this is my podcast, the NCF primarily exists as a vehicle to viciously attack people Christian extremists hate all around the world. And I'm 
going to quote now from Sludge, a website that analyzes the way evil pieces of shit pump their money out across the world. Yes. Quote, According to the three most recent available tax filings, which cover 2015 to 2017, it has donated $56.1 million on behalf of its clients to 23 nonprofits identified by the Southern Poverty Law Center as hate groups. I certainly don't know of any public disclosures of funds to hate groups at levels anywhere near this, Heidi Birick, uh, director of the Intelligence Project at the SPLC, told Sludge. It's pretty astounding and certainly concerning. According to a 2017 Inside Philanthropy article, NCF is probably the single largest source of money fueling the pro-life and anti-LGBT movements over the past 15 years. In 2017, NCF's donation to anti-LGBT, anti-Muslim, and anti-immigrant hate groups rose to over $19 million. That's a lot of money. It's good. Good stuff. Good stuff. They're, 10 billion years, Cody. It's called salvation, yeah. <laughs> yeah. The NCF pours money into the Alliance Defending Freedom, a network of Christian lawyers who want transgender people to be mandatorily sterilized and want homosexuality to be made a literal crime. Uh, the Alliance Defend... That's how you defend freedom, by putting people in prison. Uh, <laughs> Nothing says freedom like enforced, enforced sterilization. sterilization. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, God. We're the helping. Alliance def- <laughs> The Alliance Defending Freedom is currently opposing the Equality Act, which would ban discrimination against LGBTQ Americans. David Green doesn't ever really say hateful things, but this is where he puts his money. In fact, since NCF donations make up more than one third of the ADF's budget, it's likely Green has put quite a lot of money into this group. If we want an idea of how the United States would look if Green and his friends got their way, we can hop over to Uganda. And Cody, that's what we're going to do right after these ads for products and services. Oh, I can't wait. Yeah, yeah. You know what won't turn our nation into a uh, hate-filled religious theocracy? Deli- Cody. Deliverables. Pudding? Deliverables. Mm-hmm. Pudding? Pudding will not also turn our nation into a, a, a fundamentalist hellhole. Energy drinks. It is well known that fundamentalists <laughs> cannot drink pudding or eat energy drinks. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Off we go. Goodbye. We're back. Mm, uh, yeah. Cody. Yes. You, uh, you, you enjoying this fun tale of the man who sold styrofoam roosters I, over the world I and like used it him. to fun bigots? Yeah. He's, yeah. Uh, I like his answers for stuff. Yeah, they're good. And I'm glad he's that- He's a neat dude. Yeah, the, his answers are uh, up, uh, he's up front and he's forthright and uh, there's mm-hmm. nothing behind it. Uh, nothing there, it's he's speaking from his heart about uh his what he wants to do and why he's doing it i like it in 2008 the ncf gave eight hundred and seventeen thousand dollars to ed silvoso an evangelical minister from california who do, works directly with julius oyet the ugandan bishop who led the charge against that nation's 2014 anti-homosexuality bill here's how human rights watch describes it Quote, the law permits sentences of life in prison for some sexual acts between consenting adults. It criminalizes the undefined promotion of homosexuality, a provision that threatens human rights advocacy work and prompted a police raid on a joint U.S. government McCarrary University HIV research and intervention program. The law also criminalizes a person who keeps a house, room, set of rooms, or place of any kind for purposes of homosexuality, a provision that has been used to justify evicting LGBTI tenants. Numerous gay people have been rendered homeless by the law since its inception. Human Rights Watch talked to one of them, a lesbian woman named Hanifa, who showed them her eviction papers. Quote, You have been nice to me and paying me very well, but due to the existing situation in the country, plus your behavior with your friends, forgive me to suspect you of being indecent. I cannot allow you to rent my house. I cannot fight the government. Ooh. Yeah, and it's hard to know exactly how much of Hobby Lobby money went up in these efforts, but the NCF sent millions of dollars to different groups in Uganda pushing these laws. And like, you know, obviously part of the goal of having organizations like this is so a guy named David Green can claim none of his money directly went to it. Exactly. But also millions of his dollars go to this group, which spends millions of dollars doing this shit. Yeah. Uh, smart. Smart. I mean, smart. Define, define smart. <laughs> I mean, Smart Cody is providing me with a pr- place to buy both uh, paintbrushes mm-hmm. oh. and uh, uh, those fake books that I can put up on my counter to make it look like I read. You're a reader, uh, yeah. Yeah, and and uh, clay for which people can make, I don't know, crucifixes out of. You can make anything. Crucifix? Anything out of clay, uh, yeah. A larger crucifix? A larger crucifix. A smaller ones? A smaller one, a, yeah. A frame any, to put any it in? Any size of crucifix. Yeah. yeah. Oh, 
Oh. Yeah. Uh, there's... Uh, they, we won't get into it. There are laws uh, like that that are being introduced in uh, various states this year. Um, in there sure are, Cody. Yeah. There sure are. Probably do an episode about that on our other show. But uh, Yeah, yeah. And if you trace back the money behind those laws, I bet they go to the same place as these do. I would believe that. Yeah. Yeah, the NCF is also one of the groups that uh, Chick-fil-A, for example, gets like lambasted for supporting. Mm-hmm. But like for whatever reason, Hobby Lobby has not a- acquired the same amount of ire. Mm. Interesting. Until now. In the first few months after the bill's passage, at least 17 LGBT people were arrested under suspicion of homosexuality in Uganda. Three transgender individuals were sexually assaulted in police custody. Charity organizations that provided contraceptives and AIDS medication were forcibly shut down. Under the new law, even doctors were allowed to deny basic treatment to gay people. Human Rights Watch talked to one transgender man who went to his doctor with a fever. He said the doctor asked him, But are you a man or a woman? I said, that doesn't matter. But what I can tell you is I'm a trans man. He said, what's a trans man? You do- oh, we don't offer services to gay people here. You people are not even supposed to be in our community. I can call the police and report you. You're not even supposed to be in the country. <sighs> this is kind of the world that David Green wants yeah. for the United States. Yeah, uh, Yeah, yeah. Through his donations to the NCF, David Green has supported all this. He has also supported a number of anti-Muslim and anti-immigrant hate groups. The NCF gives money to Act for America, the American Freedom Law Center, and the David Horowitz Freedom Center. I love freedom. (laughs) You love freedom, I know, and it always is good things. Yeah, I like organizations with Mm -hmm. freedom and liberty in their name, because that means it's good. That means means it's good. Yeah. It never means the freedom to oppress broad swaths of the population. No, 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 no. Well, how dare you? How dare you? How how, how, how dare you? No, freedom is good. Whatever you said is bad, but not my freedom or liberty. Yeah. Cool. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, so David Horwitz of the David Horwitz Freedom Center uh, mm-hmm. believes that, quote, the whole Muslim world is pursuing a final solution to Jews yeah. and that American Muslims represent the real neo-Nazi movement in America. What the fuck? It's not those Nazis. What the fuck? It's the they're Muslims. Like, they, literally, they literally say that they're neo-Nazis. Yeah, it's not amazing. Them, but uh, come on. Oh, no, they say, I think Horwitz is an all of them kind of guy. Yeah. 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 No, the I mean, I, mean, I, don't, I mean, like, the oh. Nazis say, like, oh, they're oh, Nazis. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they use the word. Yeah. The Alliance Defending Freedom uh, is an anti-LGBT group currently lobbying to make U.S. law as much like Uganda's as possible. Uh, they provided Hobby Lobby and David Green with free lawyers in 2014 when the billionaire Hobby Lobby owner decided to strike a blow against birth control and the Affordable Care Act. This whole thing stemmed from the fact that the ACA required company health insurance plans to provide access to contraceptives. Crucially, the Green family insisted they did not object to paying for all kinds of contraceptives, just the morning after pill, which they believe violated heavenly law for reasons I think are dumb. Mm. Pregnancy actually begins when a fertilized egg attaches itself to the wall of the uterus, and the morning after pills are meant to prevent this. Uh, But the Greens argued that any action taken to prevent implantation once the egg is fertilized is the same thing as an abortion. The Greens also argued that paying for IUDs would violate their deeply held religious beliefs. In 2012, when the series of lawsuits began, Green insisted, we simply cannot abandon our religious beliefs to comply with this mandate. In 2014, the case made its way to the Supreme Court, which was probably David Green's goal from the beginning. Hobby Lobby won its suit, which established that corporations with religious objections could opt out of providing mandatory coverage to their employees. This marked the first time in American history that the Supreme Court declared businesses were capable of holding religious views. Most of the coverage of this event portrayed it as simple moral consistency on behalf of David. As he told The Independent, you can't have a belief system on Sunday and not live it the other six days. Mm. However, when you actually dig into how David runs his company, he seems notably less consistent about, for example, the sanctity of young life when that young life might actually cost him some money. And I'm going to quote now from an article in Rewire News. Quote, When a very pregnant Felicia Allen applied for medical leave from her job at Hobby Lobby three years ago, one might think that the company best known for denying its employees insurance coverage of certain contraceptives on the false grounds that they cause abortions would show equal concern for helping one of its employees when she learned that she was pregnant. Instead, Allen says the self-professed evangelical Christian arts and crafts chain fired her and then tried to prevent her from accessing unemployment benefits. They didn't even want me to come back after having my baby to provide for it, she said. 
Allen had been hired as a part-time cashier in July 2010. Not long after she started the job, she found out she was four months pregnant. She had not been working long enough to qualify for parental leave under the Family Medical Leave Act. Allen went to her supervisor. I asked her, would I lose my job due to me being four months and only having five months before having my child? She told me, no. I felt like everything was okay. I had talked to my boss. She let me know that everything would be okay. I would still have my job. But when she actually had to give birth and take her leave of absence, her supervisor told her that she would be fired for doing so. She tried to reapply to her job after coming back, but was not rehired. When she applied for unemployment benefits, she claimed Hobby Lobby lawyers lied to the unemployment agency and said that she had chosen not to take parental leave and quit. The court eventually agreed with Allen's version of events, and she won her claim for benefits. She sued Hobby Lobby in February 2012, the same year that the company started its battle with the ACA. But that case was dropped immediately because, it turned out, she'd signed away her right to sue the company without knowing. All Hobby Lobby employees are required to resolve legal disputes through arbitration, which heavily favors the corporation. Yeah, yeah oh, there we go, baby. Yeah, we got yeah. there. Awesome. And Cody, oh. how would you feel if I told you that Hobby Lobby's arbitration wasn't a normal arbitration agreement? Wasn't uh, the... Yeah. I would feel wholly unsurprised by yeah. that statement. Yeah. Um, I don't... I don't... I don't like to get political. Um, you don't. You but, don't. You're famous for that. Yes. But um, what if we didn't tie uh, health care to our employers? I mean, Cody, it's that's a nice dream. But, you know, it, like, can you point out, I don't know, for example, a couple of dozen nations on the planet with higher standards of living and longer lifespans in the United States that do something like that? I've actually never heard of a second country. Oh, okay. So uh, then our education system's working. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I, I think uh, whatever whatever comparison you were going to make or point you were going to make would have been lost on me. I would have been like, "What's what's Canarda? I don't know even uh, if that's a reference to a, a nation." So no, 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 it's actually a gas station uh, somewhere up past Tacoma. Mm -hmm. um, okay. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I'm going to quote Rewire News again, discussing the, the peculiarities of Hobby Lobby's arbitration That's so, policy. Because, yeah, like, even, <laughs> like, even before you get here, it's like, yeah, companies prefer arbitration because, uh, oh, God, all right, go ahead. It benefits sorry. them massively. Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. All right, okay, here we go. <laughs> One thing that sets Hobby Lobby's arbitration policy from most corporations is its allowance for Christian-influenced arbitration. What? The mutual arbitration ag <laughs> agreement Allen signed gives employees the option of choosing to find an arbitrator either through the nonprofit American Arbitration Association, the largest dispute resolution service provider in the United States, or the Institute for Christian Conciliation. The company Hobby Lobby uses for their Christian arbitration is called Peacemaker Ministries, whose principles include the idea that Christians are not allowed to sue other Christians. Christians. This is incredibly convenient for the Christian owner of a Christian company who fucks over his Christian employees. Now, Hobby Lobby... <laughs> Right. Hobby Lobby insists that its owners' beliefs are not forced on employees, outside mm -hmm. from the fact that they won't pay for your birth control because of their beliefs, which is kind of forcing their beliefs on you. Mm -hmm. But Hobby mm -hmm. Lobby won't force you to be Christian, although they do actively evangelize their employees. David Green has hired three chaplains to minister to his employees. He claims that hundreds of employees have been converted to Christianity this way, including 15 managers in a single year. As David told The Independent, we prayed a prayer with them, and we did have 15 managers come to know Christ in the business place that uh, seems good that's above good. board that's above board because once they know christ they can't sue you yeah yeah i i wonder how many have, have been like yeah sure i'm christian now yeah knowing that like they'll be in the good graces a little more mm-hmm I mean, I had to join Jack's weird Buddhist set, which I, <laughs> I still have trouble believing that MMA is a critical aspect of Buddhism, but mm. Jack says so. Yeah. Or, um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> 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 I'm do an MDMA that joke. Rewire <laughs> article quotes Alex Colvin, a professor at Cornell and an employment arbitration expert. Uh, he said this of Hobby Lobby's arbitration policies. I think it's an interesting confluence here with Hobby Lobby being in the news with that big case. But if that were an employment case where an employee wanted to make a claim, we would never see that case at the Supreme Court because it would be stayed in arbitration. So ironically, Hobby Lobby gets to go to the Supreme Court because they want to challenge this, but their own employees don't get to go to court. That is ironic, isn't it? Mm, I, would, I was going to use the word fair, but... Um, very fair. I guess... Uh, very right, fair whatever. and cool. Morally consistent, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, 
And good, speaking righteous, of moral righteous. consistency, <laughs> while the craft store chain apparently considers the morning after pill a clear and present danger to their faith, they did not have the same issue with supporting the Chinese government. The vast majority of Hobby Lobby's products are made in China. They spend billions of dollars a year importing from that country. And up until 2016, the Chinese government enforced their one-child policy by, in part, mandatory abortions for pregnant women. David Green decided this mattered less than maximizing the profit margins on his knickknacks by having them made in China. So it just, it, it, like, the, these beliefs are only ironclad up until they're not as profitable. Yeah. Then they don't matter. Yeah. I mean, that's, again, it's wholly unsurprising. Yeah. Um, but at least they can uh, deny their employees care. That seems good. Yes. Their employees that they make memorize all the prices <laughs> because the barcodes now, are the devil. Of course, Cody. Yes. Of course. Yeah. We can understand in our society how you might have to deny employees access to certain medicines because the way that they deal with eggs and stuff is against your poorly understood religious beliefs. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. While also being like, but we're still going to, you know, buy a bunch of stuff from China because that's just the only way to get enough styrofoam roosters. Yeah, yeah. But I can, we can guarantee Hobby Lobby wouldn't do something like invest millions of dollars in the same drug firms that produce the pills that they say are against their religious beliefs. That would, have, of course, be a massive violation of what they believe, right? Yeah, um, I agree. And I choose to um, leave this podcast <laughs> uh, before you uh, make your next point. Hobby Lobby's 401k plan for employees includes some $73 million in mutual funds that are heavily invested in the very same drug firms that produce emergency contraceptive pills, what? intrauterine what? devices, and drugs commonly used in abortions. It's also worth noting that prior to the ACA, Hobby Lobby's health insurance plan covered all these devices. It's almost as if what really matters to David was establishing the legal precedent that corporations could discriminate against employees based on religious beliefs. It is almost exactly like that. It is almost exactly like that. That's and wild. It's, it's not cool wild. Stuff. Again, so, co- again <laughs> wholly unsurprising. Wholly cool and unsurprising. Ugh. And boy, howdy, have the implications of the Hobby Lobby decision been vast and terrifying. In her dissent to the 2014 ruling, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg declared, the court, I fear, has ventured into a minefield. Two years later, in 2016, the Los Angeles Times evaluated the impact of the ruling so far like this, quote, The minefield Ginsburg warned about has now detonated. On Thursday, U.S. District Attorney Sean F. Cox of Detroit ruled that a local funeral home was well within its rights to fire a transgender employee because its owner had a religious belief that gender transition violated biblical teachings. Cox's ruling puts the lie to Justice Samuel Alito's denial in his majority opinion in Hobby Lobby that the ruling would provide a shield for a wide range of discriminatory practices by allowing them to masquerade as religious scruples. Our decision today provides no such shield, Alito wrote. Ginsburg, who was on the short end of the 5-4 decision, knew better. She said there could be little doubt that religious claims would proliferate because the court's expansion of religious freedom to corporations invites for-profit entities to seek religious-based exemptions from regulations they deem offensive to their faith. She asked, where is the stopping point? Suppose an employer's sincerely held religious belief is offended by high uh, health coverage of vaccines or paying the minimum wage or according women equal pay for substantially similar work. Within days of the ruling, there were already 49 cases from for-profit organizations claiming religious objections to the ACA, and the ruling is increasingly used to cloak illegal discrimination in the robes of religion. Wheaton College even argued that the ruling meant they could refuse to fill out medical paperwork stating that they would not pay for contraceptive coverage, because doing so was one step in a process that would lead to other entities paying for that coverage. So they were well within their rights to fuck with employees' private lives, even if their money wasn't on the line. That's awesome, huh? Oh cool my God, stuff. That's so sneaky. Gross. <laughs> oh, my God. Oh. It's still too early to say precisely what the long-term impact of the Hobby Lobby ruling will be. But it is clear that it has fundamentally changed the game as regards religious freedom of speech. There is now established legal precedent to protect wealthy individual religious extremists from abusing people they disagree with in almost any conceivable manner. You might note that this is basically a slower, less bloody, but ultimately just as violent a way of achieving the same basic goal that ISIS set, a state completely dominated by extreme religious law with no freedom or ability to dissent. Guys, I just wanted to talk about ISIS, Robert. <laughs> This well, Cody, sucks. This I have sucks. some good news for you, because <laughs> now we're going to get to the part of the story where Hobby Lobby helps to fund the precursors to ISIS. I guess that's lighter. Is that li- is that lighter? Cody looks yeah. really sad, you guys. It's bumming me out. 
It's a good story. Everybody loves a happy story. Yeah, everybody does love a happy story. A happy now, lappy. Cody. <sighs> yes. You know what won't lead to the establishment of a theocracy in the United States that strips people of very basic fundamental human rights in order to maximize corporate profits? Is it products and services? It's, that's exactly right. Yes! <laughs> I knew it! Yeah. I knew how to save the Republic. <laughs> It's products and services. That's the problem. There just weren't enough products and services in 2014. Mm -hmm. Well, Hobby Lobby only has products. They don't have services. Mm, Exactly. And this is why podcasts will save the Republic, is Mm -hmm. the sheer sheer deluge of products and services that we can bring in to to rescue our fellow Americans from this encroaching nightmare. Exactly. This is a revolution. the heroes. Mm -hmm. This is the beaches at Normandy, and we are fighting bigotry with products promo code save the world (laughs) (laughs) ad break we're back Mm. so cody we just talked about how david green's goal is basically the establishment of a religious uh state along the same lines as isis but slower and more profitable Mm mm-hmm yeah, and speaking get, of yeah. Islamic terrorists, Ooh. <laughs> David Green helped to put piles of money in the pockets of Islamic terrorists so he could have a fancy museum. Ooh. Right around the same time Hobby Lobby won its case in the Supreme Court, stories on the company started spreading the word that David Green was creating a Bible museum in Washington, D.C. Politico reported that the museum would likely cost the family more than $800 million and involve a repository of tens of thousands of biblical antiquities that the family had recently acquired. The mission of the Bible Museum was, at first, to inspire confidence in the absolute authority and reliability of the Bible. Green later modified this slightly to invite people to engage with the Bible. <laughs> yeah, he knows what he's doing. Yeah, he, he really mm, does. Smart cookie. In 2010, Hobby Lobby president and David's son, Steve Green, visited the United Arab Emirates with an antiquities consultant. There they inspected 5,548 artifacts. These objects, according to a later legal complaint, were displayed informally, spread on the floor, arranged in layers on a coffee table, and packed loosely in cardboard boxes, in many instances with little or no protective material between them. That's how you're supposed to do it. It's like, like, take you to the garage and like show you like, here's the antiquities. Here's the antiquities over there, there's the corner over there, there's the antiquities We sell heroin too. Yeah, you want some? (laughs) Some of them is inside. Get get that pot. you. Now, these antiquities mostly consisted of cuneiform tablets and balls of clay imprinted with ancient seals. The whole situation seemed very shady, and it was, but the dealers provided what's called a statement of provenance. See, antiquity theft is a major problem, particularly in the Middle East. Since the early 1990s, between 200 and 500,000 objects have been looted from archaeological sites in Iraq alone. Cylinder seals and cuneiform tablets, the same kind of objects that dis- were displayed by Steve Green in the UAE, uh, are the most frequently looted items. Since 1990, cultural objects from Iraq carry special import restrictions that include criminal penalties. That's not just because the U.S. government wants to stop these items from being looted. In fact, it has much more to do with the worry that these items are being looted by terrorist organizations and used to fund violent attacks across the world. During the height of the Islamic State, illegal antiquities looted within its lands were estimated to have been valued at between $4 billion and $7 billion, Thanks. which is obviously an incredibly wide possible range. ISIS's Department of Natural Resources, Antiquities Division, charged a 20% tax on saleable antiquities. And most experts seem to think the group probably didn't make more than a few million dollars from its looting program. But that is plenty of money to carry out horrific attacks. The November 2015 Paris attacks, for example, killed 130 people and cost roughly $10,000. It is worth noting, of course, that in 2010 and 11, ISIS was not really a thing, but its precursors did exist, and so did other extremist groups, like Al-Qaeda, who profited from the sale of antiquities in Iraq. The simple reality of the situation is that people who buy antiquities in Iraq have, at that, and at that point had, no way of knowing that who they would support with their purchases. Most experts simply advise people not to make these kind of purchases, since it's impossible to do so and not fund terrorists and the illegal theft and destruction of cultural artifacts. But the Green family didn't care about any of that. They wanted fancy old Bible shit for their Bible museum. <laughs> yeah. As I mentioned earlier, Steve Green traveled to that UAE meeting with an antiquities expert. She advised him not to purchase any of the clearly shady artifacts on offer. Her exact quote was, I would regard the acquisitions of any artifact likely from Iraq as carrying considerable risk. 
And I found an interview with this expert conducted later on a blog dedicated to antiquities research and study. Here's how she described the reaction to her warning. I can't say they reacted one way or the other. They didn't seem surprised or upset, which in hindsight is kind of surprising. The impression I had at the time is that they were only considering buying antiquities. I had no idea until I read the complaint released later th- uh, last week that this was already in process. They had already, earlier in July, before I talked to them, looked at cuneiform tablets. You would think if I'm talking about, you have to do this and that, and they're already in negotiations, they would have had some reaction to what I said. I'm pretty mystified as to why they bothered to have me do this for them. Mm. Why do you think they had her do this for them? No reason. Just like they're interested. They like history. and They like and history. Yeah. yeah. The why became clear later. <laughs> Hobby Lobby wired $1.6 million to seven different bank accounts associated with five separate people to buy the items. They had the artifacts shipped to the United States in numerous packages with fake labels, identifying <coughs> them as tile samples. The packages were also shipped to multiple locations. In doing so, Hobby Lobby and the Green family followed well-established procedures for smuggling illegally obtained cultural antiquities. In that interview with the antiquities expert I quoted from earlier, the interviewer asks her if she thinks the Greens might have just consulted her to learn how the legal process for importing artifacts works so they can more easily devise a scheme to break the law. No. Here's her response. No. I suppose one can't rule that out, which would be very upsetting to me. I can't rule that out. My goal was to discourage them from doing the wrong thing by telling them all the wrong things they could do. I thought they would not want to do those things. I can't rule out it was all the opposite, that they used my advice to evade the law as opposed to follow the law. Hmm. Can't rule mm-hmm. it out. Christians, yeah. it's this is great. We're religious. We believe in morality. Yeah, they have very consistent morality. Yeah, which is that all that matters is what they think of the Bible and not preserving historical antiquities or avoiding funding terrorism in foreign countries because that has nothing to do with Christianity in America. It has nothing to do which with Which is it. all that matters to them. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Which is like, it's discussed, like, one, like there were a lot of like groups like the Free Burma Rangers, which are like a heavily Christian organization d- dedicated to providing like emergency medical care in war zones and stuff. And so these are like very religious people who would like go get shot at in order to provide emergency first aid to people fighting and dying in Mosul at the same time as these billionaires who call themselves Christians are like funding violence around the world in order to have a fancy museum yeah it's it's sickening yeah um I like that first part you talked about it seems like a real Christian thing to do yeah yeah, it's providing emergency medical yeah. care to, to vulnerable people. That does seem more Christian than funding Al Qaeda by stealing artifacts. It seems like it, but maybe it's not. It I'm not, like you know, I'm not. But you know, we're forgetting uh, Mark twenty three thirty when Jesus stole the Statue of Liberty uh, in order to hide it in his underground lair. <laughs> I thought that you actually had a Bible verse in the in your head no. that you were quoting. That's the one. <laughs> That's right next to his his giant (laughs) coin Mm -hmm. and uh, yeah yeah. his giant coin and uh, his Mona Lisa he Mm -hmm. he has the original of course of course yeah Yeah. (laughs) he's got that uh, that one painting that got uh, cleaned wrong and now it looks all smeared yeah (laughs) that's his that's that's his piece like the the center of his yeah yeah, yeah. that's his whole his whole life has been leading up to getting that yeah the Gnostic verses are just about Jesus stealing art (laughs) (laughs) yep. That's why the church had to suppress them. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm I'm well uh, well versed in history and religion, so I know exactly what you're talking about. Now, fortunately, the Greens were worse at smuggling artifacts than they are at imposing religious law on the United States. That's right. <laughs> Customs caught them, and in January of 2011, uh, Border Patrol began seizing objects, roughly 3,450 in total, that Hobby Lobby had illegally imported. The resulting civil asset forfeiture case bore a hilarious name. The United States of America versus approximately 450 ancient cuneiform tablets and approximately 3,000 ancient clay bulli. <laughs> that's amazing. That that's was written, that was written yeah. down? Yeah, that's the name of the case. Oh, yeah. Oh, that is oh, record uh, for the good ages. Stuff. It's, it's good stuff. <laughs> Now, Hobby Lobby was caught red-handed, and they didn't even really try all that hard to defend themselves. The case was that obvious. I mean, yeah. The company claims to have accepted responsibility for its past conduct and promised to revise its internal procedures, which is meaningless because their employees were warned by an expert not to do what they did before the acquisition process began. Yeah. But David Green lied and claimed that this was all the result of Hobby Lobby being new to the antiquities business and making (laughs) rookie mistakes. On the Hobby Lobby website, he wrote this, We should have exercised more oversight and carefully questioned how the acquisitions were handled. Hobby Lobby has cooperated with the government throughout its investigation, and with the announcement of today's settlement program, it is pleased that the matter has been resolved. (laughs) 
<laughs> the settlement involving Hobby Lobby returning all the ill-gotten artifacts and paying a fine. But they are left in possession of more than 40,000 ancient relics, some of which will be displayed in their Bible Museum, yes. and only a small fraction of which will ever be made available for serious scholars to study. I spent a lot of time reading the blogs of different archaeologists and antiquities researchers, and they all seemed pretty uniformly to agree that the Green Collection basically kept important historical objects hidden from everyone but a small coterie of experts that the Green family personally likes. They were also in agreement about the fact that the Bible Museum and the Green Collection is almost certainly filled with other stolen and looted items. And I'm going to quote now from one of the more prominent blogs in that ecosystem, Anonymous Swiss Collector. Quote, you can't collect antiquities without risking buying looted ones. Every purchase is a risk. Best just not to do it. You can't collect antiquities on the scale of the greens, massive scale, without certainly buying a lot of loot. This is common knowledge held by everyone in the trade. The antiquity business runs on layers of plausible deniability. Not asking too many questions, leaving things implied but not said, opaque business practices, lack of regulation. Claims of not understanding the law are not an excuse for breaking it. Don't be fooled by this. In this case, the greens had advisors and independent experts who told them flat out that these purchases were wrong. They did it anyway. Why do it then? Well, we have a lot of research on the topic. Basically, the Greens were probably able to neutralize their actions by convincing themselves that they were above the law because they were buying the antiquities for magical evangelical purposes, <laughs> saving them from the darkness of obscurity in a non-Christian country. I mean, that is speculation. Their neutralization technique might be a bit different, but it'll be something along those lines. It always is. Yes, I do think there are looted antiquities in the Museum of the Bible. I think there are lots and lots of looted antiquities in there. I can't prove it to an extent that would let some country make a return claim, but please understand, there is no legitimate source of these kind of artifacts. Not on that scale. Looting is the source, and lack of provenance is the proof. But, cool. ca counterpoint, mm -hmm. uh, the ma magic stuff. The magic stuff. Have that you, is a good counterpoint. You know? Yeah, he, it, and he does not disprove magic in this blog post. They, Ergo, exactly. Hobby Lobby's good. So that should, he should have talked to me because clearly he hasn't considered all sides to this. Yeah, he did not. He did not. You consider all things. Yes. Much like a radio show that I've forgotten the name of. All of the, every, every little bit of uh, the mm -hmm. information is being thought of. Yeah, yeah. This is why it's important to see both sides of an issue. Both the side that says, literally the only way to have gotten these objects is massive theft and the funding of international terrorist organizations. And the side that says, but mm. Jesus. Yeah, the, 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 have exactly. you the, the magic? Exactly, the two sides. The, the, yeah, the, the, the magic. The, the magic. Oh. And you sort of trail off. So, yeah, case closed, you sort I of think. Trail off. And that's really how you know you've won the argument when you sort of trail off. Mm-hmm. I love trailing. Yeah, off. yeah, yeah. It's like hiking. You know, trails are good. Exactly. Uh, you pick yes. one, doesn't matter, uh, and you just keep going and going, and then you slow down, and then you sort mm -hmm. of you sort of slow down, sort of trail off, and then you so win. Cody, yes, <laughs> and then you win. How do you feel about Hobby Lobby after all this? They're not my favorite good? place. Um, aroused? If I were to get, uh, I mean, I'm always aroused, so Thank that's you. not really, you know. Um, that's why we have you on the show. Thing, exactly. That's why, that's, why I, that's why I come on the show. Mm -hmm. um, Bam! Damn! <laughs> did it! Um, I, uh, if I were to get a knickknack, if I were to ne it, like be in the business of knickknacks, I probably would go to a different place. <laughs> that's I think if I've I learned. were in the business of knickknacks, I would just patty whack and then give a dog a bone, but... I mean, you know, yeah, different strokes, you know, different strokes for different old men who come rolling home. Mm -hmm. Yep, who are constantly aroused on podcasts. <laughs> yes. Interestingly, I, I some fan out there needs to graph the amount of times we make cum jokes uh, when it's just you and I, and and when we have our third person mm. here. Um, I would because like. I think we make less. Call her by her name. I might. I might make more actually, because I know that she hates the word "cum." So I say Katie it a lot. does hate the word "cum." Yeah, and now we are upping our "cum" quotient and at I, the end of the episode. Exactly. And earlier, when we were talking about this feels uh, abusive, Canada, I almost, you guys. I almost referenced uh, the uh, "come and go," mm -hmm. that chain of uh, gas stations. Oh yeah, yeah. But I, I held back. Um, but here we are I, saying it now. 
I love it when regions have a thing that is clearly like everyone outside of that region knows that the name is hilarious, like come and go or like the game cornholing, Mm -hmm. which is played in certain parts of this country that just are like, no, it's just this game that we all play. (laughs) What is what is funny? And everyone else is like, butt sex. But what if you call (laughs) it something else? (laughs) I miss Katie. Uh, Oh, yeah. We we all we all miss Katie. This would not be happening with if Katie were here. (laughs) We probably would probably have wouldn't just, have started with Hitler. Probably wouldn't have ended on come. No, and we would have just we would have figured out a solution to the Hobby Lobby pro- problem. Katie would have like ridden into their offices on a sea of blood with a sword made out of cultural antiquities and beheaded David Green in order to bring peace and tranquility to the kingdom once again. Yeah, she would have put. But feet on she's the ground. not here, and so we just have come jokes. Yeah, just voices in the air instead of feet on the ground. That's the, mm-hmm. that's the difference. That's the Katie Stoll it's difference. True. I know. We all miss Katie. When does the museum open? Uh, that's a good question, Cody. Let us ask the almighty El Goog. No. <laughs> you didn't like that? I did not like that. All right. That was weird. Not an El Goog fan. It opens 10 a.m. Saturday. It's, it's open now. <laughs> it's pet, yeah. It opens... <laughs> The grand yeah, opening it's, is it's, tomorrow. It, it, I don't it's okay. still around. It's, okay. it's, it's open It's open right now. Ew. Let's, so you uh, can go 430,000 square feet. That's uh, really big. That's really big. <laughs> it's got a great view. It's got a beautiful view of Capitol Hill, which they seek to dominate. It's a big, uh, that's a big step up from that uh, 300 by 300 mm-hmm. original mm-hmm. Uh, I'm sad. tiny picture frame. Do you think they sell tiny picture frames in the Museum of the Bible? They'd better. They'd better have tiny picture frames in that gift shop Mm -hmm. and a bunch of styrofoam cocks and stuff. I mean, one of the things that is at least amusing to me is that on the Museum of the Bible's page, their logo is clearly supposed to be like, it's a bee on its back, so it also kind of looks like uh, the Ten Commandments or an open book. But more than anything, it looks like a butt. Hell yeah. Yeah, Yeah. they did So that's good. That's good. I think we're going to win. Yeah, yeah, we're Yes, yes, we have all the power now. <laughs> yeah. I'm sad. I thought logo we were really like doomed uh, we before have, we I realized their dollars. logo kind of resembles a butt. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And now I realize that victory is inevitable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, days from now. Hey, Robert, days from now. This is going yes. on too long, sir. You know what's not going on too long? Cody's pluggables. Oh, That's yeah. true. They go very short. Hi, uh, check out Worst Year Pod, which is a show that we all do. Um, also, some more news. Uh, it's on Twitter and it's on uh, Patreon. It's on YouTube. Uh, my Twitter is Dr. Mr. Cody, uh, D R M I S T A R C A D Y. And uh, uh, check out uh, Katie Stoll on Twitter as well, who's not here. <laughs> We miss but you, is in Katie. spirit here. Is in spirit. We miss much you much so like much. the Holy Spirit, and just like the Holy Spirit, she's telling us to steal antiquities from Iraq. Exactly, exactly, Classic and Katie. we will. Uh, even more news is the name of our podcast. Uh, <laughs> pluggable over, Robert. I'm Robert Evans. That's true. <laughs> the <He's>, episode's done. <laughs> he, don't don't follow him on Twitter. Just don't, kidding. Don't do it. No, Robert you actually... Can find us Robert's a great... I feel like you're great on Twitter, just, just to give you a compliment. It's true. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. I am great on Twitter. And uh, you can find me on... Uh, you can find the website of this podcast, BehindTheBastards.com. And we also have another podcast, Worst Year Ever, about the election. And you can find your neighborhood Hobby Lobby if you need to buy a styrofoam rooster and further choke the oceans with the detrius of uh, civilization. Tight. Tight. All right. We're done. We're done.